Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. And uh, before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are so very grateful uh, for this morning, uh, for the things that you have shown us from your word, and for your mercy and grace and love towards us and towards all that you have created. And we just pray, Lord, that um, in studying your word, we can come to know you more closely, uh, that we can uh, approach you, that we can see the sins in our lives, the things that need to change that are unlike Christ. And we just ask for his presence through thy spirit here as we open your word together. We ask to be taught of you and that you can encourage each person searching for truth. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning again. So uh, just before we started, you know, Stephen had asked a question about uh, um, the article. It's uh, January 20, is it 24th, 1864? Was it 26th? I can't remember. What's what's the date I, of the article? I think it's the 26th. The 26th? Yeah, because I kind of thought, always thought it was like 126, but... So that's, it's the article where, where I believe that Uriah Smith wrote, because he's the editor of uh, the review at the time, because James White is basically taking a break, uh, because of the death of their son, Henry, and he's traveling with Sister White. So, I mean, it is possible that he wrote the article and it's written in a different style than he normally writes and uses a vocabulary he doesn't normally use, but it's not very likely. So it's it's most likely that because it's unsigned and Uriah Smith is actually the editor, that he wrote the article. Um, he doesn't. They don't change his name on the masthead, uh, just because you know he's just temporarily the editor and he's just a young guy. So you know, so he's not listed as the editor at the, at, at that time, but he actually is editing the review. So so it's most likely Uriah Smith wrote that article. It's not a huge thing. Um, there is the book that James Wright, White wrote in, you said 1876 on Miller? I think it's 75. 75, okay. And in that book, he, in, in one of the footnotes, he definitely appears to be endorsing, uh, Miller's understanding of Leviticus 26 of the seven times. So, so there isn't, there isn't a great deal of evidence that James White ever personally rejected that understanding, um, just that one article. And, and it's more consistent with Uriah Smith. One is he quotes Jesenius. Um, and it's consistent with what Uriah Smith put in, um, one of his, uh, footnotes, I guess, in Daniel and Revelation on Leviticus 26, where he's dealing with the age to come people, which later developed into, um, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses through a series of stages. Um, because Barber is going to be a part of that age to come movement. And then, uh, uh, Charles Taze Russell is going to be a follower of Barber. And so, so that's kind of, and they use the 2520, but quite differently. They don't use it from Leviticus 26. They use it from, uh, Daniel chapter four. So anyway. That was just uh, something we were talking about before we started this study, which I thought I should maybe mention. Now, uh, before that, Aran and I were addressing some math. And so I'm going to look at that first, sort of a little bit out of context of what we're studying. But going through these verses of Daniel chapter 11, before we get to verse 40, when it's describing uh, the papal power, it's going to talk about uh, dividing the land for gain. So in Daniel 11, verse 39, it says, um, Thus shall he do in the most strongholds uh, with a strange God whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory. And he shall cause them to rule over many and shall divide the land for gain. Now, when I see, you know, words like divide, uh, I think of them mathematically. And and so I thought, well, maybe this this phrase here, and I don't think it's super significant things that we found, but I just want to get it uh, here in the record. 
so that, uh, you know, that I remember it, that it, I'm not going to forget about it. So when we look at divide the land for gain and we do the gematria of that, so just the straight English, it's going to be uh, 187. So, so that's kind of a clue that we can also pay attention to that phrase. Do people agree that divide the land for gain since it adds up, the gematria adds up to 187? That's a clue that it means something. I'll just show you the gematria here. Here is uh, divide the land for gain. You can see the normal sum. It equals 187. So that's symbol of July 18th. So just for that reason, uh, we can say, well, maybe maybe we should be looking here to see some clue of how this relates to things. Now, um, also, we have the Hebrew numbers. So the Hebrew numbers can uh, obviously mean things. So I, I added them all together. Uh, 2505 for divide, uh, 127 for land, and 4242 for gain. And I came up with the number uh, 6,700. And what's the number? I'm going to, I'm just going to do it again so people can see it. So take 2505. That's divide plus 127. And then I add the 4242. That's the word gain. And I get six six eight seven four, and and that that is if we counted from uh, September eleventh two thousand one, that's going to bring us to July seventh twenty twenty. It's going to be eleven days short of uh, six eight eight five, which is the number of days from uh, September eleventh to July eighteenth twenty twenty. So it brings us to uh, July seventh. So um, now as far as 11 um, as a symbol, we, we do have 11 as a symbol, but I'm not sure that this is very significant. It's just what I did, right? So I did that math and I try to say, well, okay, that's kind of interesting. It's close. It's 11 days off. Uh, another thing that I did was I took uh, gain for 242 and I divided it by land, one, two, seven, leave us. And then I get 33.4. And so, so I thought that was kind of interesting. So it's, so I, I look at that and I say, well, is that years, right? Cause it could represent 33.4 years. And so, um, so I just multiplied it by 365.25 and, and you get, Basically, it's 12,200, 12, right? So 12,200 or 12,200 days. And, and, um, so, you know, I, I looked at how that would relate to our lines. You know, if I, I go to November 9th, so if I go to November 9th, 1989, and I count 12,200 days, it's going to bring me to April 5th, 2023. Now, April 5th, 2023 is uh, Passover. It's also that April 5th, 2030 date. So that's seven years prior to that April 5th, 2030 date on the Gregorian calendar. So I, I thought that was rather interesting. So it gives us that date. Um, I don't know of anything significant about April 5th. Uh, 2023 as far as what happened uh, that was last year of course but the fact that it's it's the Passover date I thought interesting and then I looked at um, uh, 31 AD so on the Passover in 31 AD which is going to be there in the Julian April 27th that's going to be when Jesus is is crucified um, so I just counted back 12,200 days from there. Go minus. Oops. Minus. And so if I go back, it's going to bring me to December 1st, 4 BC. And the date there is on the biblical calendar is uh, 9 11. Now that's going to be uh, traditionally um, for people who believe that Jesus was not born on Christmas Day. Uh, we often put the Feast of Tabernacles as the day 
that Jesus uh, was born in 4 BC because he tabernacles with men. And that's going to be the 15th of Tishri. And, and that's just um, eight weeks. Um, so if we added the eight weeks to that 12, 12,200 days, it'd be 12,256 days between the birth of Christ, if that's when he's born. We don't know the exact date, but that's often the guess people make, uh, to his crucifixion. So just some interesting little details, whether they, they mean anything, I don't know. But, uh, where, where we, where I do find some stuff that's rather interesting has to do with uh, looking at this the, this phrase itself regarding dividing the land. And any thoughts on any of that math? No thoughts on it? Okay. So um, what I did is I looked up the word divide land. So here in my search engine. Okay. And uh, so some of these phrases here, well, Numbers 33, 54, and ye shall divide the land by lot for an inheritance among your families. So obviously we know they divide the land. And uh, we have this word lot, 1486. And I can't remember what we did with this word before. I think there was some significance in that number. Just can't remember what it was. Okay, but anyway. Because I know 1461 is uh, exactly for Gregorian years. So I can't remember what there was about that. But anyway, uh, so they divide the land. And we know that it's going to be Eliezer and Joshua that are going to be involved in that. Um, they're going to have one prince from every tribe to divide the land by inheritance. The number is 3418. So it's about dividing this inheritance. Now, so we got that in Joshua 1, verse 6. Be strong and of a good courage, for this people shall divide for an inheritance the land. And then in verse uh, chapter 13, verse 7, it says, Now therefore divide this land for an inheritance unto the nine tribes and the half tribe of Manasseh. So we know uh, why is there nine tribes and the half tribe of Manasseh? What land's being divided there? Right. So this is going to be this, the land on the west side of the Jordan. That's going to be divided that way, right? And divide the sea, divide the land by inheritance. It's going to be talked about in Ezekiel as well, in verse four, chapter forty-five and chapter forty-seven. He shall divide this land unto you according to the tribes of Israel. And then, of course, we have it in Daniel eleven, verse thirty-nine. <clears throat> uh, but here it's going to be dividing the land for gain. So it's not dividing it for an inheritance. Um, and so this, this is referring not to God's people dividing the land, but this is the papacy dividing the land for gain. So, so what would that mean symbolically? If we put this in the context of this, the land is normally divided for an inheritance and now it's going to be divided for gain. In other words, instead of treating this as a gift from God, they treated it as something where they were going to be able to profit from it and mm -hmm. choose greed over worship. Right. So so it's it's part of the counterfeit. There is a dividing of the land, but it's it's not for good purposes. It's it's the papacy is a counterfeit. So instead of an inheritance from God, they're seeking gain. Okay. Now there was uh, another interesting part of this in Joshua that uh, I don't think we it's here. So <clears throat> in Joshua chapter 18, so it says the whole congregation of the children of Israel assembled, assembled together at Shiloh and set up the tabernacle of the congregation there. And the land was subdued before them. And there remained among the children of Israel seven tribes, which had not yet received their inheritance. And Joshua said unto the children of Israel, how long are ye slack to go to possess the land, which the Lord God of your fathers hath given you? Give out from among you three men for each tribe, and I will send them and they shall rise and go through the land 
and describe it according to the inheritance of them, they shall come again to me. So what is describing referring to? I mean, we use it in English in a, a more modern sense. But what does describe mean? What are they doing? Survey. Would it be yeah, surveying? Yeah. They're going to just survey the land, right? So they're going to uh, note the landmarks. I mean, it doesn't mean they get out there with uh, one of those, I can't remember what it's called, a transit. Um, uh, spy, out, spy out the land. Yeah, but yeah, so they're going to they're going to mark off the borders, and they're going to come back and say that you know, okay, this is the land we want. Um, and and it says, and they shall divide it into seven parts. Judah shall abide in their coast in the south, and the house of Joseph, Joseph shall abide in their coast in the north. So Joseph, of course, being Ephraim, right? It's just another name for Ephraim, Ephraim the son of Joseph. So. So you got you got uh, Judah in the south, that's the southern kingdom, and Ephraim in the north. Uh, ye shall therefore describe the land into seven parts, and bring the description hither to me, that I may cast lots for you there before the Lord our God. But the Levites have no part among you, for the priesthood of the Lord is their inheritance. And Gad and Reuben and the half tribe of Manasseh have received their inheritance beyond the Jordan on the east, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave them. Okay, so we got the seven parts. So, so what's being described here? My, my understanding here is that there's actually nine tribes that are on, uh, the east side or the west side of the Jordan, including the half tribe of Manasseh. So you have a half tribe of Manasseh on the west side along with Gad and Reuben, and then you have another half-tribe um, with uh, on the west side with uh, nine other tribes. One of those or is is uh, Joseph. And the, you mean the east side? Yeah, Sorry. the west the west side is where you have nine tribes. So on the east side, you have Gad and Reuben and a half-tribe of Manasseh, and then you have a half-tribe of Manasseh on the west side. Right. Along with nine other tribes, two of which are uh, Ephraim and Judah. Right. Joseph and Judah. And that means there are seven tribes that had not actually uh, received their inheritance. Is, is that sort of what's being said here? That's that's why I take it that there are seven parts that those are the. So we got we sort of have. Ephraim and Judah figured out. I don't know if anybody knows this really well. Okay, so anyway, they're going to describe the land, and then they're going to divide it. So they divide it into seven parts. Then they describe it. So it says they're going to divide it into seven parts. But first they have to describe it, that is to mark it out. And the Levites are not going to have any of these this land. So the Levites are going to be not counted in this, right? So we can see we got 12 tribes if we don't count the Levites. Otherwise, we have 13 because the half tribe of Manasseh, right? That's that's Manasseh and Ephraim that make up Joseph, but half of Joseph, half of Manasseh is on the east and half is on the west of the Jordan. Now, what about the numbers of these verses when it talks about the Levites have no part? Among you for the priesthood of the Lord, it is their inheritance. This is in Joshua 18, verse 7. So we have again in this addressing the Levites, the verse that addresses the Levites in this dividing of the land, we have the symbol of July 18th, just as we did with the phrase uh, divide the land for gain in Daniel 11, verse 39. So if they're dividing the land for gain, that is the papacy, they are a counterfeit of the priesthood that we have with the Levites. Does that make sense to people? Or am I jumping, skipping steps here in logic? Now, we also have the symbol of seven parts. So what's what's the symbol of seven parts? What? Why is that important? You know, you can have the word Sheba, right, which is the word from Leviticus 26, that deals with the seven times, 
And then the word parts is just another form of the word a divide. So it's we're going to describe the land into seven divisions because 2505 is uh, the word that's translated as divide. And then they translate this word as portion or part. And one's chalik, the other one's chalik. Chalik, just different vowels. Right? Don't sound too much different, chalik and chalik. <clears throat> okay. So, so it is describing, uh, the division of the land into parts. So it's dividing the land into seven parts. So what, what symbols could we attach here? Other, we got the seven times. We have this connection to Daniel 11 verse 39 is a counterfeit of this. Anything more? Okay. So there's some things to think about and, and some numbers and symbols that we might be able to Employ a seven. Well, you got the seven and the three, which would make ten, but that's the, I mean, I don't know what that would mean, but. Well, yeah, well, you got seven, three, and then you have two, so it's twelve, and then you have the Levites, that's thirteen. It's just counting the tribes, but yeah, I know what you mean. I mean, we, we have symbols there, and I think once we get into the present truth application of that, I, I think we'll find more significance in these numbers as they relate to the periods of time. So anyway, I just wanted to look at that just because I was looking at it earlier. So we, anyway, going back to Daniel chapter 11. So we, we now can see that there's more of a flow, flow as we move through these verses. That the purpose of all of this is to lead us to the man of sin, right? To To show us the papal power. And if we think about the beginning of Daniel chapter 10, where we have uh, the matter and the vision. So he understands the matter. He knows and understands the vision of the evenings and mornings, right? So he knows the 2300 days and he understands the 70 weeks. And we can say that the, definitely those, those two prophecies are the subject of Daniel chapter 11. First, we need to have Rome in order to crucify Christ. And then we need the papacy uh, at the end. That, that is the things that are happening in that history in connection with pagan Rome are going to, with the destruction of Jerusalem and all those different things that happen, are going to be a type of what's going to happen at the end of the world. And the papacy is going to be at the end of the world. It's going to be at the end of the 1260 when the time of the end happens. Uh, but it's also going to be revived uh, and involved in what happens in the very final events. So we have these two times of the end, of the, the appointed times and the times of the end, connecting us with not just Millerite history, but with our history. So it's, it's a very unique view of Daniel 11 that I've never seen before. And and we came to it just through following these studies in detail and seeing what God had revealed to us about them. Okay, so, you know, so how we've been studying, I think, is is the key to understanding um, those ideas that we, if we hadn't studied this way, we never would have seen what we see. And I believe it to be true. I believe that's what that that's what's coming from the study of God's word. So we have that time appointed, um, the time of the end, for yet it is at a time appointed, and we had this um, that they're going to try them, purge them, make them white. We know that this is going to be uh, quoted in Daniel 12, right? So it's basically just in a different order. Many shall be purified and made white and tried. So instead of tried first, it's going to be listed last. And, and that's going to be addressing, we believe, the Millerite history. And so we discussed a little bit about that yesterday, that, that it's actually pointing to the end of the 1260 years, uh, the, the end of the 1290, and uh, the 1335, right, which in verse 12. Um, that is that period from the time of the end to the end of the prophetic periods. So the opening up of the book of Daniel is being talked about there. 
So um, I'm not sure where to go from here. Any thoughts on any of that? I mean, we have the fall of Rome. We have uh, how this is all typical. We have the rise of the papacy. And um, and that's where we're going to get to the end there in verse 40. So, so the time appointed, right, it's going to describe the papacy from 36 to 39. And then it's going to bring show us both of those times of the end. 1798 and 1989. So any thoughts on that? No one has any comments on it? Now, Stephen, did you watch the study from yesterday? Because you weren't here yesterday, right? Uh, yes. So do you agree with that idea of how we're looking at this, this progression? You know, what I just described, does that make sense to you? I have to sort of go over it. Keep going over it, I don't know. Maybe see it more. I'm okay. wrong. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I mean, every time I go over it, it makes more sense. But but we can see, you know, the main idea here is that uh, we know that there's the 1260. That's obviously being, uh, you know, the time of papal supremacy is being addressed. And then because we're going to start with that transition. So we're going to have, you know, 508 and we're going to have 538. Both of those are going to be addressed, right? Because in verse 31, arm shall stand on his part. We put that as 508. And then the taking away of the daily and the placing of the abomination that make it desolate. That's from 508 to 538. And, um, and such as do wickedly against the covenant shall be corrupt by flatteries. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do. And they that understand among the people shall instruct many that they shall fall by the sword and by flame, by captivity and by spoil many days. So this is the period in which God's people are being persecuted, the 1260 days. But when they shall fall, they shall be hoping with a little help. So we looked at um, Revelation chapter 12. You know, there's this flood that goes after the woman, and the little help is the United States, right? And the United States arises when, according to Ellen White in the Great Controversy? When does this power, the two-horn power of Revelation 13, arise? Right? We know it's there. Yeah, 1798. So we know it's there before, during this persecution. But it's specifically in 1798 that it becomes this power, right? This two-horned beast. Okay? So, so then it's going to go back. So, it, well, it's going to talk about the time of the end. So the time of the end has to be 1798, for it is yet for a time appointed, right? So that, that to me is 1798 to 1844. And some of them of understanding shall fall and try them and purge them and make them white. So, again, that refers us back to the 1290 and the 1335 in Daniel 12. Even to the time of the end, because it is yet for a time appointed. So we can see that that's the time of the end. Okay. So we're saying that this trying, purging, making white is the three angels' messages. Uh, and we looked at that word to the time of the end. And in that preposition there uh, can mean at the time of the end. Right? So it's just, so I'm saying it's at the time of the end that you have this message, this three step testing prophetic message. Now, one of the things that's kind of interesting here, um, so notice this word try, but what do, what do you notice about this Hebrew number? Six, eight, eight, four. Well, six, eight, eight, five is the number of days from September 11th to is it July 18th. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, so this is, um, very close, right? Now, th this word try, if we took 6885, it, it's, it's actually just now used as a noun, and it refers to a goldsmith in Nehemiah 331. And after him repair Malchai, the goldsmith's son, unto the place of the Nethanims and of the merchants over against the gate, uh, uh, Mifkad, and to the going up of the corner. So, so we can see it's re re it's related to 6885 because that's just the noun form of uh, the word try. Trying is a verb. Uh, obviously, goldsmith is not a verb. I mean, he's a person that tries things, that purifies them. 
right? If we look up this word, we can see that it is actually refers, and it can refer to a goldsmith as well. It's the idea of refining something, right? Purging is to remove, uh, purifying something, right? Making it bright, testing or proving it, so they're, they're related. And then making white, uh, three, eight, three, five, um, has to do with making something bright. So, so it's just something that's pure, right? So we understand that word. So it's, it's the purifying or the making white of, of gold or character. And, and so we can see how this relates to, uh, the three step testing message. And, and we can relate it, of course, the message to the related to scenes as well. Some similarities there. So, so I think it's kind of interesting that the word try, it, it would be the number of days between from the end of September 11th, 2001 to the start of July 18, 2020, if we wanted to look at it that way. So we, it goes back then in verse 36. The idea that I see here is it's going to talk about this period and then it's going to go back and address the papacy in more detail. It's going to introduce the Pope as a person, right? So we have, we have papal Rome as a kingdom, but now we're going to have this king and the king shall do according to his will. So that's obviously the king of this power that's just been described. And we know in second Thessalonians, it's, it's, uh, Paul is really quoting this in, in, in respect to the papacy. And we know that the power that has to be taken out of the way is going to be uh, pagan Rome. So paganism has to be removed. The daily has to be removed for the man of sin to be set up. Abomination of desolation. And and so then it's going to describe this. And it's going to talk about that he's going to prosper till the indignation be accomplished. So the indignation is, you can say the indignation is, the 2520 as a whole, right? That is the 2520 that is for Northern Israel, right? Not the 2520 for Judah. And then we looked at the word determined for that that is determined shall be done. Now the word determined means to, to divide something or to cut it off. And, and we looked at, um, Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, where it talks about 70 weeks are determined upon thy people. It's a different word, but it has the same meaning, right? So it's a, a synonym. It's, it's or not a, yeah, a synonym. They, they mean the same thing, but just a different, different word. We have lots of synonyms. And then, uh, yeah, so we looked at that and we looked at, um, so the idea is that this, that this is talking in a sense, we can say that Daniel chapter 11 is addressing the 2520 in the context of the 70 weeks and the 2300 days, right? Because it, it's going to be addressing the 2520 in Daniel chapter 12 for sure with the 1260 of which the scattering of the power of the holy people occurs and then the 1290 and the 1335 that are going to begin in both begin in 508. So definitely the 2020 is the topic of Daniel chapter 11, because he already understands the 70 weeks and he already understands the 2300 days. So he's, he's being shown the 2520. He's being shown, uh, an expansion, I guess, of the daily and the abomination of desolation. Now there's probably a lot more in these verses, but it, it describes the papacy. And then when we get to verse 39, which we just looked at, at the beginning you also understand it. Yep. Does he also understand the 1260 with the indignation yeah. last uh, second 1260? No. See, so he doesn't understand that yet. Right? In Daniel chapter 11, um now in Daniel chapter 7, he's going to he's going to know about the time times and a half for the papacy. So he's going to know about the 1260, but he doesn't have a place to put it. Right. So because he's given an understanding of the 70 weeks and the 2300 days, because even when he first studies the 2300 days, he doesn't understand it. Right. 
Yeah. So, so the 70 weeks is going to give him the starting point. And so now he's going to know the 2300 days. But what he doesn't know yet is the seven times of Leviticus 26. He doesn't know the two indignations, the two desolating powers. He doesn't know the periods of time there yet. And so that's what's going to be shown is the connection between uh, the daily and the abomination of desolation that we've talked about in chapter 8. So he's going to be given light on that aspect of chapter 8 because he understands uh, the vision, right, and he understands the matter, but does he understand the chazon? Not quite yet, I would think. Not quite yet, right? Uh, So so that's what chapter 10, 11, and 12 are, are really addressing. They're addressing these, the 2520. Okay. Does that make sense? And, and the 2520 in its two different aspects. That is, uh, the 2520 is the two 1260s and, and that he doesn't have an understanding of. So, so he doesn't really have an understanding of the time of the end. Right. right yeah. Right, I can see that. Okay. And so that's what's going to be shown to him in these passages. It's going to be mentioned in Daniel chapter eight, verse 19. But it's not um, for, you know, and it's going to talk about the last end of the indignation right? in, in chapter eight, verse 19, right, where it says, I, I will make thee know what shall be at the last end of the indignation for at the time appointed the end shall be. Right. And so he's going to describe uh, Rome, right, coming in and destroying the prince of princes, right, standing up against the prince of princes. And then it's going to talk about the evening and the morning, which was told is true. Therefore, shut thou up the vision, for it shall be for many days. And But he says, I was astonished at the vision, but none understood it. So in chapter 9, he's then going to be given, because he wants to know the end of the 70 years. And, and then he's going to be given the prophecy of the 70 weeks, the matter, the decrees. So he's going to know the beginning of what happens the 70 weeks, the 490 years, and he's going to be told at the end of that, the city and the sanctuary are going to be destroyed after the Messiah who comes is going to be cut off. So now he has understanding of the matter, the 70 weeks in chapter 10, and he has understanding of the vision, right? He understood the matter, the Dabar, and he has understanding of the vision, the Mara. So that's when he's going to pray, and that's when he's going to be given Daniel chapter 11. So it's going to go through and address the daily, that is these pagan powers, and how they lead to the papacy. So when we get to this verse 39, the one before verse 40, thus shall he do in the most strongholds with a strange God, whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory, and he shall cause them to rule over many and shall divide the land for gain. Now, when we look at this in Swearingen, and, and that's, basically what we have in our uh, notes, because this is just Swearingen's uh, outline of the historical application. So it's his uh, paraphrase or interlinear or whatever you want to call it. He's putting in uh, the historical application of these verses. <clears throat> and so we've changed some of them um, up to verse 36. Uh, but when we can go from 30 to 7 to 39, we haven't addressed his interpretation of these ver- verses. I'm not sure that I agree with his interpretation. So, so going back to 37, neither shall he, papal Rome, regard the God of his fathers, the true God, nor the desired woman. That's referring to the celibacy of the Catholic clergy. And I would agree with that. Nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. And uh, I'm just going to get rid of an extra space there. So he shall magnify himself above all. Uh, the papal claim to equality with God. Now, when does that occur? I mean, we, we don't have papal infallibility uh, as a official doctrine until July 18, um, 1870, right? Interesting uh, date. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. July 18th. July 18, 1870 is when papal infallibility uh, occurs, but but he is magnifying himself above all that is called God, or all that above all, right? 
in second Th- all, all that is called God or whatever um, in second Thessalonians but but this happened during the 1260s but obviously we don't get that uh, official doctrine of papal infallibility until July 18 1870 so which yeah is an interesting date and we do have that connected in our lines uh, in Daniel chapter 11 so we can go back to that date and count I think we have it here just hang on we have it here in these notes? No, I think I just have it in a chart, so I don't have it in the footnotes. I'll have to find that. I know we can count from July 18, 1870 to June 27, 2019, 54,400 days. That's the tribe of Issachar. I think that's when I first noticed that date when we were addressing, addressing that. But we also had it in our more recent lines. Yeah, so that was... If we took Daniel 11, verse 16, the Levitical sum is 47,903 inclusive days. And that's the number of days from July 18, 1870 to September 11th, 2001. Uh, I'll just show you this so you can see it. So we definitely can take that date and connect it. And remember, it's he that cometh against him shall do according to his own will, and none shall stand before him, and he shall stand in the glorious land, which by his hand shall be consumed. Now, this is pagan Rome. So we can see that that verse, Daniel 11, verse 16, gives us this connection to this July 18, 1870 date to September 11, 2001, just by taking the Levitical numbers, right, that or the not political, lexical numbers, the lexical sum, that is all of the Hebrew numbers added together, gives us 47,903 days. Okay? So we had looked at that that before. So now when we address this, even though it doesn't talk about papal infallibility, um, you know, per se, and he talks about papal claim to equality with God, um, I still think that we can relate that. So it's going to be something later. It's not during the 1260 that they get that claim of papal infallibility, but definitely the idea that the Pope is in the place of God um, is, is there. So the next part, but in his estate, he shall honor the God of forces or fortresses, you know, this military power. So of course that's the power of the state. So, so the Pope um, isn't just a religious power, it's a political power. That's the main idea there, right? We would agree with that? Yeah. God. God. So, um, so I, I want to word this differently than what he has. So um, I'm just going to take this verse or this part, he shall magnify himself above all. This is... Um, it, I can't think of the word that I want to use, but it's a uh, religious, it's a religious claim, right? It's, um, we'll just say religious authority, uh, but it's, it's, it's more than just uh, ultimate religious authority. There's some better word than that. The ultimate looks good addition for that. I was thinking of a better word than ultimate, but I just can't think of it. And then um, maybe universal religious authority. I, I think I like better. Supreme religious authority. Yeah, supreme. That, that's maybe good if I spell it right. And then when it comes to uh, this, this is referring to um, the state authority, uh, power over the state. Or state authority. There's probably some better phrase I could use. Now, then when it says, and a God whom his fathers knew not, shall he honor with gold and silver and precious stones and pleasant things. Now, he's going to put the Virgin Mary in here. And I'm not sure that I would. Why, why does he have the Virgin Mary here? Is that really what this is about? Well, Mary would be secondary to, to the Pope. Well, yeah, but I, I just think um, a God whom his fathers knew not. So he's just taking this more in, in this literal sense of, okay, nobody nobody worshipped the Virgin Mary before. 
right? So this is this new God. And, and he's, so he's taking this in a very literal sense, you know, this, the gold, the silver, the precious stones, the pleasant things. And then says that thus shall he do in the most strongholds. He just puts there that Christendom with a strange God. Now, I'm not sure if I would use strongholds to describe Christendom. Stronghold seems more of a military or. Yeah. Like that. Yeah. So this is a castle or fortification. Uh, like a defender, a fortress. And it's, so it's two words, actually. The most strongholds is two words, 4013, which is uh, a fortification or castle, but it's also connected with the word ma'az, that is a fortified place. So like a fortress, right? And then, um, now of course, strange God is foreign God. So the gods of heathenism and now, I mean, in a loose sense, or in a partial sense, maybe, you could say that Mary's a part of that. But I, I think this is just much more addressing the idea of paganism in general. They're just basically saying that the papacy is a pagan religion dressed up as Christianity. And maybe maybe Mary can symbolize that. But but I don't think I would just put her, you know, there. In, you know that that that's what this is describing directly, the Virgin Mary. Now maybe maybe I'm not Catholic enough to understand it. Maybe Catholics would argue with me. They, they say the religion is about Mary, but but I think that's actually a bit more of a modern thing. I mean, obviously Mary's always been there, but uh, you know, it, the cult of Mary is is definitely popular among uh, evangelical Catholics. Because uh, I know a number of evangelical Catholics, and a lot of things are about Mary. But I don't know if it was that huge in the past. It just seems to be more of a, a modern thing. Even though it's, Mary's always been there. Okay. But anyway, but I would think that this is is also about the military as well. Because he's going to honor the God of forces or fortresses. Now, and it says, and a God, but you know, in Hebrew, we just, they just have a consecutive Vav. It's just, it's just, you know, that's how they put their sentences together. So it doesn't mean it's something in addition to that we could put, and that is a God whom their fathers knew not, shall he honor. So, so, so obviously this is paganism. And if we look at the different things, we have gold, of course, we know, and silver, uh, precious stones. Uh, so obviously that's going to be uh, yakar, which means valuable things. And then pleasant things, 2530, the things that we can delight in, beautiful things. I mean, this to me would describe the whole of the Catholic religious system. Right. I mean, if you think about the Catholic Church, it's it's cathedrals and it's, you know, it's buildings, all of its idols. Uh, it's all meant for beauty so that it's it's dressing up this oppressive power in all of these um, these symbols that, you know, are symbols of of God's goodness and wealth and, and beauty. Now, now what about in his estate of well, this word estate, but in his estate, he shall honor, uh, uh, the God of force forces or fortresses. Now the word honor, of course, um, it means literally to be heavy and it can be used in a bad sense, burdensome, a severe gall. In a good sense, numerous, rich, and honorable. So the word actually has two almost opposite meanings. And, it, and, and the estate, it just means to stand, that is, a pedestal or station, a base, a foot, an office, a place. So if we're looking at the papacy, this, this power, this king that shall do according to his will, he's exalting himself above every god and speaks marvelous things, the word marvelous, a great, difficult, wonderful, you know, so, you know, obviously it's applied sort of in a, a negative sense. It's more like something that's hidden, hard, hidden, 
things too high. So, so he's not, he's not speaking good things against God. He's speaking marvelous things against God, uh, the God of gods, which is God. And he shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished, right? And neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of woman, nor any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. This is why some people would say this is France. But we can see he's not, you know, the papacy is not really honoring any God, right? Because he's above all, right? So he's magnifying himself above God. But then it says, but in his estate, in his pedestal, in his base, he shall honor the God of fortresses or forces, right? So technically it's a fortress, a fortified place. So when it says in his estate, whose estate is it referring to? Is it the Pope's estate or God's estate? Does that make sense what I'm asking? Yes. Okay. So in whose estate is it? Is it saying in, in the Pope's estate he shall honor the God? Or is it saying in the estate or the place or the base where God should be honored that, that instead this other God is honored? And, and, I, and I wonder why they put this one as a capital G in Daniel 11, verse 38. Here, I'm just gonna, here so you can see this better. So in his estate he shall honor the God of forces. Or fortresses. So they, they put this as a capital G. I don't think I would have if I was translating this. He shall not God, regard the God of his fathers. That would be God. The God of gods. That would be God. But in his estate, he shall honor the God of fortresses. That doesn't make sense that that's a capital G. Any comment on this? How could we, how could we show what this verse is talking about? I sort of take the word estate as being Rome's estate and maybe, yeah, but well, I could be wrong. I just uh, yeah. assumed that. Yeah, me too, right? So that's the way that I always kind of looked at it. Just I looked at the word estate and I just, you know, so um, so that's one way of looking at it, that in the place of Rome. But, but I don't know if that makes sense. I mean, I mean definitely... Uh- you would agree that God should not be capitalized there, that the God of fortresses. With my Bible, it's, uh, it's uh, no capital. Okay. Can, can you explain that a bit more? I'm saying uh, it's, uh, it's not in capital. It's not in capital in yours? Or it shouldn't be? Yes. Yes. But the age is not in capital. So here it says it's a capital in the e sword. So what do you have where it's not a capital? I'm using a KJV. Okay. So just a, a printed Bible? This is, uh, this is the one which has got uh, the, Concord, uh, the, the, what, the commentary for Daniel and Revelations. Okay. Yeah, because I wouldn't put a capital. So I'm not sure why it's capital here. I don't know if that's like a typo on eSword or if it's just um, – It's you know, not some- – it's not so in the King James it does have a capital G. In the seventeen sixty nine King James it is a capital G. Okay. Now the alternate reading of this verse would have this as being, but in his stead he shall honor the God of munitions, and a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold, silver, and with precious stones and things desired. Yeah, okay. Now, yeah, yeah, munitions, I don't, I, I would think fortresses makes more sense because it's actually, I mean, you could say it, it, it is fortifications. That's the idea of the word, ma'az. Now, it, it's, it's from 810, which means a fortified place. And, and I, and I do think that, um, I've seen other places where they talk about fortresses, the God of fortresses. But uh, they say here, a place or means of safety, protection, refuge, stronghold. Right? It's often translated as stronghold. You're going to see it here in the most strongholds in Daniel 11, verse 39. So it's going to be translated as strongholds. Definitely forces doesn't make any sense. But also, 
Um, and I'm not sure why they put a capital G there. Well, so I think they're interpreting this verse a bit differently. They're also using Isaiah 44, 9 as one of their references to this with pleasant things. Yeah, just because of the word delectable things in that verse. They that make a graven image are all of them vanity and their delectable things shall not profit. And they are their own witness. Yeah, so, I mean, this definitely is referring to the idolatry of the papacy, right? Correct. And and to me, this is describing, I mean, can you consider their cathedrals and churches and so forth to be kind of uh, a type of fortress? They can be. Yeah, and their, their monasteries and all their different buildings. Um, and that's the way that I think that, that I understand that, that in his estate, that is in God's estate, they're going to honor, they're going to honor all of these churches, these buildings and everything with all their idolatry attached to it. So I wouldn't put this as, you know, specifically, um, you know, this, this as dealing with Mary. To me, this is just the whole religious system that is put in the place of God. That that's the way that I would interpret this verse. All of their idolatry, all of their their show, is all uh, um, in his estate. So I take his as being God's estate. Shall he honor? That is the papacy. Honor the God of fortresses, which is not a God whom his, you know, the fathers knew. Right? He's going to honor them with all these this idolatry. And he shall do in the most strongholds. So this is, so if we're going to take the most strongholds, I mean, this is going to be where the papacy is operating from. Right? Well, here again, the the alternate Hebrew would call that the fortresses of munitions. Right. I know. I know that they keep using munitions there. But I don't think munitions is a good translation of the Hebrew. Right. All so, I'm doing is, is pointing yeah, out yeah, King yeah. James. Yeah, yeah. The the translators give that option. Okay. So so this would be referring to to me the most strongholds. Wouldn't this be the Vatican? Wouldn't be this be where the Pope is operating from? This shall he do in the most strongholds? And um, if we look at, I just want to look at the Hebrew spelling here. Yeah, so I thought so. So it shouldn't be translated as in the most strongholds. Um, um, it, it has a lamet at the beginning, not a, a bet. So this would be more, well, the context here would be more to like from the most strongholds or to the most strongholds in the sense that that is where he is is doing this from, not in it, but from it. And, and we can see here Mitztar and Maaz. And then we're going to have, yeah, and the strange gods. Stronghold, can, can it not uh, be the military strength? Because uh, maybe that's, that's where he's getting the power from. Okay, so, and, and see, that's where I, I think... I understand, but if if we look at the the progression here, so if we go back to what was being talked about, yeah, because to me it's more a fortress or a fortification from a spiritual sense, because these are going to be places that are going to be places of idolatry, right? Okay. And, but yet they still have this sort of the Catholic Church is still a a state, right? It's not just a religion. So we had it earlier, right? It's going to be the supreme religious authority is going to be pointed out, um, as well as um, the power over the state. So maybe I could even put supreme civil authority. I'm going to do that just so we can see, right? So it, it has power. Boy, I'm terrible. Okay. So it has supreme civil authority. So those are the two characteristics that are being described. And now it's going to 
So that's he, he honors the god of forces or fortresses, right? Now he's going to do that. And I don't want Virgin Mary. So just this this power, this civil authority. He's going to honor with gold, silver, and with precious stones and pleasant things. So I'm just saying that these fortresses. Cross this out because I don't like that word right there. That's what I prefer, but I'm going to put it in italics just to show it. How it that. A god whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold, silver, with precious stones, and pleasant things. So that's the god, and I'm going to change this. I don't know. I'm going to cross that out too because I don't like that. It just doesn't like the repeated word. Okay, so the god of fortresses. A God whom his fathers knew not, shall he honor with gold, silver, precious stones. So to me, this is about, this is about, you know, so we have civil authority there. We have religious authority, but it's going to be um, expressed from a church. That is, the papacy doesn't set up the world government. It controls the world government through its religion. Right. That's what it does. I mean, they have the Vatican, so they kind of have a government. But, but the idea of of the papacy is it it's supposed to sit above the governments of the world because of its religious authority that gives us it, its civil authority, and that it that it does this from these churches, these fortresses, and um, it's going to honor these things with all of these beautiful items these valuable items through this idolatrous worship and then he shall do in the most strongholds so to say that it's his christendom i would just say from the vatican so again i'm not going to put the virgin mary in there um so this is a strange god or foreign foreign god whom she he shall acknowledge and increase with glory Okay, so what about acknowledge and increase? What, what is this referring to? Okay, this word acknowledge, it means uh, properly to scrutinize, to know, respect, discern, regard, to disguise. And this word increase uh, means to bring into abundance. So is this what the Catholic Church does with its strange God? Does it disguise it? And cause it to increase. And it does this from the Vatican, from its, its place of its fortress, the most, the, the, you know, I wonder how the best way to translate that, because there's two different words. I don't, I think what they're doing is they're taking two different words, like that most strongholds. I don't know if that's a very good translation, because they're both dealing with a fortified fortification. Or fortified fortress. So they're just using it as um, an intensive. Usually use the same word, but, but they are related words to some degree. So is that what the Catholic Church does? Does it disguise its worship as Christian and cause it to increase with glory? It seems that way. And then when it says, and he shall cause them to rule over many and shall divide the land for gain. Who's the them? Any thoughts on that? Would it be like the nations around kingdoms? Okay. Um, Well, could it be the them referring to these false gods? So it could be that this is referring to them, to this king, right? This man of sin, that he is going to cause them that is, these false uh, gods that he worships, worships to rule over many. So we could say that them is the false gods. He is the papacy. And then the many, I would say, would be the many different churches. Right, Christendom. I would agree with that part. Wouldn't agree with the Mary and the saints. Right, that's what he has. I mean, you could say Mary and the saints. But I'll just say false gods. So he, the papacy. I mean, that's the way that I would do it, just at first glance. Right, so you got all of Christendom. They are worshiping these false gods because of the papal power. 
Okay, and then we just got this last little bit that we started with. So him dividing the land for gain. Yeah, so here Swearingen's going to put it, the territories divided into dioceses, dioceses, or whatever, how do you say that, for economic gain. I mean, you could probably put that there. I think it's a bit more than that. How does the Hebrew actually read? Well, it just says to divide the land for gain. <laughs> That's what it says. Um, that word divide, we looked at it, it was dividing the land for lot. So we, we looked at, at um, Joshua and in Numbers, where it talks about the dividing of the land. So this is a counterfeit of it. But I don't think this is really just about dioceses. I think it is about the various nations that that the papacy definitely has a part to play in the division of Europe. But, but you know, exactly what, what this symbolizes, especially once we get to the present truth application. And that's what I'm always keeping in the back of my mind. That's why I don't like Mary in there. It's just too specific of a thing where this is more general. Here again, the 1769, instead of gain, would have the alternate Hebrew saying a price. Mm, yeah, well, I guess you could use that. I mean, but that, but the idea here is, you know, is, is really the same idea, right? That is for a price because it's about a profit. So but you, you also got your Hebrew word of 4242. Right. Yeah. Which means price, higher price, higher reward, gain. Right. So there's nothing wrong with price. It's just, it's not just that they're just dividing the land for price. This is for profit. That's the idea. So that's why I think used gain. Is there a symbolism of 4242, a type of doubling? Yes, there is. What's the 42 represent? I've always looked at it as six times seven. Okay. 42 times. Yeah. 1260s, two 1260s, right? Which is 125.20. Yeah. Okay. So so we need to keep that. And the dividing, so that's going to, okay, uh, Stephen, you said something? Yes. So the dividing of the land for game, um, mm-hmm. you mentioned there, Virgin mentions Pharisees. Uh, but there was times, I just came to my mind as an example, you have the um, the Normans take England mm-hmm. and um, the Pope then made him or sort of said we want you to rule over mm-hmm. the Irish because the Irish weren't really supportive of the Pope and okay. so the, he, prom- he promoted the English king as being like the Lord of Ireland as well to support yeah. that aspect so that the Irish would then be subjugated under the, the English Pope and sort of how, and therefore under the, under sort mm-hmm. of under the English King and therefore as a consequence under the, the Pope. Yeah, that's, that's so, more what I was thinking. Not so much I wasn't thinking of Ireland specifically. I mean, you think of that because no, you're on. No, well, that's just an example. There would probably yeah, be yeah. other nations. Right. So where he sort of, he, he promotes people who will then honor him and, and get a benefit from it. Right. So, yeah. So he, he is setting up kings and taking down kings in a sense in the place of God. So he's doing something that God is actually ultimately doing, but the Pope is trying to exercise that power. Right. Is yeah. That how so you, you could even, have, yeah, you could also apply it to like the, the, the Albigenses and the Cathars that mm-hmm. there was maybe a king there in France direction who was supportive of the Pope. The Pope said, "Well, these here are Cathar towns, whatever these areas, we want you. We'll, we'll give mm-hmm. you this here land. Just go in and, and uh, wipe out this here uh, people who are not uh, supportive of me." Okay, and and then Iran, you made a comment which I don't understand in of dealing about the capital and colon. What what is that referring to? Uh, in that verse, the uh, same word was. Capitalized and not capitalized, depending on where it was. Oh, you're you're talking about um, the word God. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's the same same word in Hebrew. So you know, four three three. Yeah. 
Okay. So this is pretty significant. We can take these two periods of 42 months. And I'm just going to make a footnote of that before I forget. Um, I'm just going to put it on here. And, and that's also referring to the week of Christ, if we think about it on the 1863 chart. So a lot of the things that, that we notice here as we, we go through these verses. Obviously, we're going to go through some of this again when we draw it on a line and then when we do a present truth application. And, and we're not going to look at Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45 yet. So we just worked up to 39. And then we're going to try to get this drawn on a line next week. We'll see what, what we can get done. Okay. Well, thanks, everyone. Let's uh, close with prayer. The dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the time that we've had this morning and for the things that you teach us. And we ask that we can submit our lives to you. Um, that we can think about these things until we meet again. Uh, we pray for each person who is looking into these truths. Help us to understand your word. We ask for your care and protection. May your angels watch over our family and friends, and may we represent you. Thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.